Ooh wee! Have we had a spicy week? Just as we are wrapping up the Contagion quest line, 2020 throws the Purge side quest at us, and I think the game mode might have been switched to Team Deathmatch. This is feeling more and more like the intro to a movie with lots of special effects, and that gives me an uneasy feeling because the folks left planet side usually don't make it. This week we've got orange Karens, a gross miscarriage of justice, and a 50 BMG AR-15. But first, a word from our sponsor, TNVC. If you like seeing stuff more than not seeing stuff, take a look at our sponsor, TNVC.com. Your source for quality night vision gear to make you the bump in the night. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the events surrounding the death of George Floyd. Uh, so I'm going to come at you with some opinion. One of the things that strikes me most about this series of events is that because Floyd's death appears so obviously to be horrifyingly negligent at the absolute least, next to nobody is defending the actions of the cop. Yes, obligatory disclaimer about how only the jury can make the final determination, only God knows the motive, and when I say the word nobody, what I really mean is a vanishingly small percentage comparable to the number of people who believe Earth is flat or that vi vaccines cause autism. And because it seems so obviously to be murder, that makes it really easy for most people to say so, including lots and lots of cops and thin blue line sticker bearers who might normally line up to defend a questionable use of force incident. And in many cases, they're not wrong. It often turns out that the longer videos or more complete context provides more legal justification for use of force. But not this time. Nobody is defending the cop this time, and I think that makes healing easier. Yes, there's a lot of anger because it's such a gut-wrenching video to watch. Yes, looters undermine the message of the protesters. And yes, some police departments seem to have lost their damn minds when it comes to their choice of heavy-handed tactics in response to protests about police violence, he said with palpable irony. I'm sure all of you saw the video of Minnesota cops shooting at people who were standing outside on their own property. Yes, it appears to have been some sort of less lethal munitions, but bear in mind that the people being shot at wouldn't have known that, nor would any observers. There were muzzle flashes, bangs, and zero indication from the officers that they intended to deploy a less lethal device for pain compliance. Anyone watching might have been forgiven if they thought the police were shooting live ammo. The people being shot at might reasonably have believed that to be the case for a few seconds too. Put yourself in that place. You're standing on the front porch, you hear shots, you see muzzle flashes, and your wife or your husband lets out a shout. What do you do? What could you do? In any case, I'm glad they didn't start a firefight. But for every incident involving looting, police violating rights, or other human ugliness, I've seen photos and videos of humans being bros and the grown-ups in the room keeping events from spinning out of control. There were several cases of protesters linking arms to defend private property from looters. Uh, this cop pulling his dumbass colleague's knee off a protester's neck. I legitimately believe that it is healthy for the people to rough up their government a little now and then and to remind them who's really in charge. It beats dragging them out into the street to answer to Madame la Guillotine. Ultimately, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to guarantee that people always have the tools they need to exert their will on the government rather than the other way around. That said, the man responsible for Floyd's death has been arrested and dismissed from his position. By all appearances, the government appears to be responding to the will of the people. The Floyd incident raises some really interesting hypotheticals, though. The bystanders did plead with the officer to stop killing Floyd, but was there anything else that a private citizen could have done to save Floyd's life? If you were standing there watching a man die, and if you somehow knew with absolute certainty the entire context, how much moral responsibility do you have to step in and stop it? Internet bravado aside, is there anything you could realistically do that wouldn't just make things worse? I've heard people speculate about the legality of using force in that circumstance. Um, obviously, any physical action could get you hurt and might only make things worse for the guy on the ground. As interesting as it is as a thought exercise, I shouldn't have to tell you that it would be colossally stupid to attempt to use force to stop the officer, even if you were willing to take one for the team, whether literally or in a courtroom. 
but there are a few things that might work. I'm going to include a link down there in the description to an article with some great insight on the subject. It deserves a proper read, but the Cliff's notes are that you're going to want to speak with one of the other officers at the scene, if possible, and let them feel like you're just looking out for them. Like, maybe you should warn them that some people are taking video and the situation might look bad out of context. Hey man, I know you're busy, but that dude over there is taking video, and if this gets out without context, it might make you guys look bad. The article gives several other suggestions that should help the officer save face, make him feel like it was his idea, and give him a way out. So take a look if you have some time. We're going to get through this, and we're going to be better for it. More people will be aware of the simple fact that police are humans and it is insanely reckless to invest a small group of fallible humans with a monopoly on violence. Every day, more people are understanding that bearing arms is foundational to self-determination and that's a good thing. But not everyone is on board. Karen's demand on constitutional infringements has been a longtime supporter of a government monopoly on violence. Last week I told you about how the Karens are planning to use the hashtags wear orange and wear orange rocks to bring awareness to their support for the police state. That probably isn't the best look right now, but today and tomorrow are the days they are scheduled to wear their orange rocks and post on the socials about it, so I'd like to encourage you to post using the hashtag as well. So take to the socials, the gram, and post your best freedom propaganda and dankest memes using the hashtag wear orange. And I want every single one of you miscreants to comment hashtag wear orange on this very video. Believe it or not, other stuff is happening in the US besides a pandemic and riots. A few weeks ago, I reported on Tennessee's weak sauce constitutional carry bill HB 2817, and now I regret to inform you that the sauce is quietly getting weaker. Lawmakers recently added an amendment that creates an exemption for several of the more populous counties, so people would need to have a permit to carry in those counties. The, the bill was already flawed because instead of simply affirming the right of the people to go armed without government permission, it would just make it legal to carry a gun without a permit if you could have obtained a permit in the first place. And so what, says you, right? I, I mean, basically anyone could get a permit, right? Aside from the principled argument that it isn't within the state's authority to grant privileges for basic human rights, the biggest problem is that there is simply no way for a non-resident to carry a gun, either openly or concealed. I had mixed feelings about this law before now, but with this new amendment, the bill is gutted completely, and my personal opinion is that we should oppose this bill fervently. It is currently sitting in the House Finance Committee. If you agree this bill needs to be stopped, please pause the video right now and call the committee chair, Susan Lynn, at 615-741-7462 and the vice chair, Patsy Hazelwood, at 615-741-2746. I have also included the name and phone number of every other committee member in the description, so please take the time to let them know that this bill is terrible. It violates the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and it's an absolute mess. It is not a good start, the right direction, or a reasonable compromise. It cannot and should not be fixed. It is hot garbage, and everyone involved should feel bad. If you believe in the fundamental right of the people to be armed without seeking the pleasure of the crown, and you want to support that right in the state of Tennessee, no matter where you happen to reside yourself, write and call the Congress critters in the volunteer state to support HB 1553, HB 2661, and SB 1566. To my own barely literate eye, they seem a much more rational and liberty-minded approach to a constitutional carry law as it ought to be. If I'm missing something, or if you just want to tell me that people in other states are on their own and should just move if they don't like the laws, leave a comment down below. I've never been to New York City, so it's possible that my perception of the place as dirty, rude, claustrophobic, and oppressive is fundamentally flawed because it's based entirely on the portrayals of the city that I've seen in popular media. But stories like this next one aren't doing anything to change my prejudice. The NYPD responded to a call to find a dead 25-year-old man and a knife at a grocery store where a worker at the store said he had been attacked by the man and shot him. 
But apparently, the worker had not received the blessing of Lord de Blasio to exercise his human right to be alive by carrying a handgun. So naturally, the king's men arrested the worker. Friends, I'm not sure what I can really say about this issue that won't get me banned from the tube of views. It is absolutely wrong to deny a man the right to be armed. Being armed and speaking one's mind are the two most fundamentally important rights, and real self-determination is impossible without both. Arresting a man for no crime other than being armed is an unforgivable affront to the Constitution of the United States and fundamental human rights. But, as terrible as it is, it's not uncommon for states to place requirements and restrictions on who may carry and under what conditions. NYC is notoriously draconian in that regard. But even in these places, it is almost universally accepted that necessity is an affirmative defense. I honestly don't have the words to articulate how trashy it is to arrest the victim of a knife attack. Do you want a fitty? Unless you're some kind of commie, you bet your ass you do. You know what the problem with 50 BMG rifles are though, right? They usually cost more than any of the vehicles that I own. Safety Harbor has announced a 50 BMG upper that converts an existing AR-15 into a mighty fitty. The single shot version of the SHTF-50 starts at 1450 and the magazine fed version starts at 1850. Both are bolt action of course, but the latter accepts a detachable box magazine on the left side of the receiver, which really ramps up the aesthetics in my book. One bit of bad news, the BATFE decided to crash the party and determined that the upper constitutes a receiver of a firearm. Because reasons. It all stems from how F Troop got caught with their pants down when they tried to prosecute Joseph Rowe, who manufactured 80% lowers and held build parties in California. Cutting right to the point of it, the ATF seems to have been wrong when it considered the lower receiver in an AR to be the serialized part based on the definition of receiver in the 68 GCA. It's complicated, but they really put their foot in it and dropped the charges against Roe to avoid a court ruling on the matter. So if you want to get your hands on one, you'll need to have it shipped directly to your FFL. If you think I have an ethical obligation to acquire one and use it to poke holes in normally bulletproof things, make a comment. America. Stag Arms made a name for themselves in the early 2000s with a left-handed AR-15 and by making quality rifles that ticked a lot of the boxes on the list at a time when the market was full of 1 and 9 twist barrels, non-F-marked front sight bases, and so on. Now Stag Arms is bringing back their Varminter line as well as launching a new line of 300 Blackout ARs. The line will include 16-inch and an 8-inch version, which can be purchased as a complete rifle, pistol, or registered factory SBR, and they'll be available as complete uppers and as parts kits. Obviously, price will vary depending on configuration, but the 16-inch version is about $1,000. Surefire is releasing a new product that feels like it fills such a narrow gap that it almost has to be a response to an RFP. The XC2 IRC is an infrared-only illuminator and laser unit that's also really tiny. Obviously, that means you can only see the light emitted from the unit if you're wearing night vision devices like the fine products offered by our sponsor TNVC. That narrows the pool of end users pretty significantly already, but most end users who want an IR illuminator and aiming device are probably going to use it on a long gun. Those who do need one for a pistol still don't need it to be really, really small because that heater isn't going to be concealed. They're rocking nods and PCs. They might be quiet and sneaky, but they're not exactly discreet. But it sounds like somebody out there wanted to operate operationally with concealed weapons and still have the ability to use NVGs if needed. Say you're doing your usual Jason Borden routine and you have NVGs in a bag or something. And the bad guys cut the power in the building and the emergency lighting doesn't kick in. Not to worry, you put the NVGs on but you still can't see much because they aren't magic. They simply amplify ambient light, and that can be hard to come by in the dark recesses of a man-made cave system. The IR illuminator on a weapon light will provide more than enough light to navigate and identify targets while using the splash off floors and walls without any need to point the weapon in an unsafe direction. MSRP is $450. If you're a fan of Teutonic space kraut magic with bad ergos, you're probably going to love the new stuff for MP5s from Magpul. Magpul introduced a line of MP5 products a while ago, 
but now they're finally listed on the website with MSRP and in stock as of the date I'm recording this. Both the short and long handguards as well as the extended selector are listed at 50 bucks. Does this mean that PSA's MP5 clone is closer to the market? Does Magpul know something that we don't know? Will Buckaroo Banzai and the Hong Kong Cavaliers be able to keep the overthruster from the clutches of Dr. Lizardo? Find out next week in another thrilling installment of ARFCOM News. Or wait longer. I, I, I don't know, man. Whether or not PSA finally releases the Dagger or their MP5 clone next week, we'll be here to give you all the news we could be bothered to read about. I hope you enjoy these things half as much as we enjoy making them. If you did and you think we earned it, please help support the channel by supporting our sponsor, TNVC, your source for everything that you need to make you the bump in the night. We always include a lot more info and links in the description, so be sure to check those out, especially our giveaways and contests. I love you.